but this is from uh, it's from Desert News, and mm-hmm. it's covering the Japanese trailer for that movie. And it's uh, what does it say here? It says fans think the new uh, the Batman trailer teases the Joker's appearance, and I actually think they're right. Um, I think so because like you're pointing out the picture to it. Yep. But my question is, I know this is a little bit off topic. Can you do your impression of Batman while reading this? No. Oh. I'm not gonna do. What my... about you, Chris? No, thank you. Oh. No Batman. <sighs> <sighs> I don't... Uh, I'm so what, what would it sound like? I don't even know. Just my voice gets really deep. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I can do that. Can you say I'm Batman in a deep voice? No, I cannot. Chris can say that. I'm Batman. There you go. That was pretty good. That's all I did. No, let me do a Christian Bale reading. <laughs> I'm Batman. Exactly. That was pretty good. <laughs> okay, now read the whole article. Okay. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, so it says, a, a new Japanese trailer for the Batman is out, giving fans a look at more unseen footage and a peek at our beloved villain, the Joker. That's a tad presumptuous, I think. Mm-hmm. That, that shows is. you um, a picture of what could be, but I don't know if that's actually what we're seeing here. It says, uh, the trailer, which debuted Sunday, stars Robert Pattinson as Bruce Wayne, Paul Dano, as, is it Dano or Dano? I say Dano. Dano. I've, heard, I've heard Dano. Yeah. I've heard both. But Dano would be with an E. It would be Dano. Uh, yeah. uh, well, <laughs> Paul, it's Paul... the same thing with the pronunciation GIF or GIF. Uh, it's, it's, mm. well, I, even though the guy who created it says it's GIF, he's wrong. No, that's <laughs> it, that's totally it, incorrect. It's GIF. It has to be. Yeah. yeah. So but it's <laughs> the same thing with the word Jim. Nope. Oh. Nope. <laughs> so Paul Paul Dano as the Riddler, Colin Farrell as the Penguin, Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman, and Andy Serkis as Alfred, according to the Independent. Uh, Batman pursues a dangerous serial killer, the Riddler, as seen in the trailer. I'm here to unmask the truth about this city, says the villain, setting the stage for corruption in the justice system. The hardest part about reading these articles is you're not doing the lines justice. Like right, right, he right. works, he works all like day, uh, weeks to craft a voice for this character, and I'm just sitting here like da 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 da. <laughs> so it's he says, justice. Yes, he says uh, I'm here to unmask the truth about the city, says the uh, the villain, setting the stage for corruption in the justice system. What fans are especially excited about is this close-up of the Riddler uh, close-up of the Riddler's notice board full of clippings of Bruce Wayne suggesting that the villain knows who the real Batman is. But some fans have dug even deeper, zooming into images of Bruce Wayne with a huge gr- uh, grin that imitates that of the Joker. Can it be him? Wrote one fan on Twitter. Uh, and they, like yeah, the, the coolest thing about these genres is the fans are essentially super fans, so they mm-hmm. will pick apart every trailer and every image and every, you know, some people go like they do frame by frame breakdowns of mm-hmm. trailers and mm-hmm. stuff. So like to me that is tempting as that is to do, especially when you're really like passionate about the material. That's hard for me to like, that's time ta- consuming. It, well, it takes, no, it takes to me, it, it kind of ruins the artistry of what they're creating, what they're, these things are being created though with a great amount of detail are being created to be viewed as one image. Like you're not supposed to look at it frame by frame and, and gather more meaning of it than, than maybe should be. It's supposed to be taken in as one whole concise image. And I think that kind of ruins it sometimes when you go too deep into it. Mm-hmm. That might be a hot take of sorts, but <laughs> no, that's true. But the anticipation is just something they can't they, yeah. they can't tamp down. Like they just have to know as much as they can. Yeah. To, based on what's available. Yeah. So it says some have recognized uh, the Joker's devious laugh. Uh, is this Barry Cogan's Joker laugh at the end of the new Japan Batman trailer? Uh, Another wrote on Twitter. This isn't the first time that the Joker has been linked to the movie. The Hollywood Reporter's Heat Vision newsletter said that the Warner Brothers that Warner Brothers was testing two cuts of the film, and I have an article about that too. We can go into that. Mm. Uh, one with a certain actor involved. Per Complex, uh, people are speculating that it's Barry Cogan who is rumored to be cast as the Joker. Cogan was cast back in 2020 as the Gotham City police officer Stanley Merkel, but the true nature of his character remains a secret. Um, there is going to be a like a Penguin TV show that's going to be coming out called Gotham PD, mm-hmm. as far as I remember, right? Mm-hmm. It's an HBO Max show. Uh, so he could be casted for that. The actor is kind of on the up right now. He played Druig in The Eternals, which whatever you think about The Eternals, it's still a Marvel property and quite a, a mm-hmm. large uh, feather in your cap if you're an up-and-coming actor. Um, what? No, I just think Is there something funny. funny about that saying, young lady? Feather? Feather in your cap. That's a saying. It's, it, it's, it's a legitimate saying. I have, I have not I'm heard just, it in a while, and I'm really glad that I just did. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I never heard of it. Yeah, well, you're also like two years old, so that's, that, that's hey. probably why. 
Um, <laughs> hey, I don't need a helmet here. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. So there's no. the actor. <laughs> um, you can see it right there. So this is the other article, and this one was from uh, Bleeding Fool. It says, uh, another rumor that has been going around lately has to do with Matt Reeves' upcoming The Batman, the role being portrayed by the Eternals actor Barry Cogan. Uh, the folks at The Hollywood Reporter don't claim uh, to know the answer to that, but they're saying that Warner Brothers has been out doing test screenings of the film with two different versions, one with a certain actor and one without, uh, to, uh, to get different audience reactions. I wonder how they find the people that do those screenings that get to see those those screenings. Mm. That would be interesting to know, like um, how you get on that list. Yeah, sometimes right? they can be super friends or like um their cr- like their um, critics because I know Black Nerd Comedy he gets invited to watch like certain movies. Mm. Yeah, but that's like an opening, not a sc- like these are test screenings. Yeah. Meaning that these yeah. aren't even the final cut of the movie. They don't well, want to show that to critics. They don't want that coloring the critics' opinion of the movie later. No, he also has like test screenings too. He's not legally allowed to talk about it, but like later when the movie comes out, he will talk about it. Well, for test screenings for the mm-hmm. for those purposes, you want the biggest bozos possible, right? I mean, yeah. you don't want like super fans or, you know, people that are that invested. You just want the average person that's likely to show up. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. now you I don't know if you find, show up. You're looking, like, you're looking for the, the zero point audience, meaning like yes. you're looking for people that might go see it if the trailer's good, might not. The f- super fans are going to go either way. Mm-hmm. Uh, in a lot of ways, they take advantage of this in, this, in these industries. Uh, mm-hmm. One thing about it is like they're, the big reason that they're making these comparisons, where if we go back to this other article, is they're, they're, they're zoning in on one small picture. Uh, that was then zoomed in really far. That could just be really good attention to detail. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the original trailers for Batman vs Superman, there was the same image of Bruce walking by uh, the graffiti suit, uh, the graffiti case of Robin's uh, outfit um, with graffiti on it. It didn't actually play into the storyline, and it never ended up in the movie. It's not like those scenes ended up in that movie. It's just something that the the mega fans will recognize from the comic, ad- you know, from comic adaptations, right. and look at it as uh, a backdrop for the larger story. Yeah, for so, sure. So it's not even necessarily super relevant to. To, to the movie it's just in there because the a lot of times they'll recreate images that look like iconic images from panels uh just for those people to be able to recognize it and it kind of gives them a deeper connection to the source material even if it's only surface level and doesn't actually play into the story right yeah. right so uh let's see it says well there's no genuine verifiable reports to back up the claims uh about kogan's secret role if accurate the audience will be shocked whether warner brothers chooses to pique the audience's interest in the series uh uh, future or leaves it in the dark will be have a significant a- impact on the film's final cut. My personal opinion is you don't even put the Joker in the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't think they a need Batman to. A Batman movie without the Joker? I know. Gasp. Uh, especially when you have Paul Dano playing the Riddler in what looks to be a very, very unique and very, very um, important portrayal. I, I don't think you need to clutter it up, clutter it up, and I think that's what keeps happening in these movies. To be honest, like yeah. if you look, we're going to talk about Spider Man later, and it's basically a Sinister Six movie, and it's just there's too many characters, in my opinion, to really be able to give enough screen time to all of them to do that character's arc justice in the movie. Like, why would you want to if, if People are already raving about seeing Paul Dano in this role. Why would you want to clutter it up? You've got two more movies, theoretically, in that trilogy. Save the Joker for another one. It, in my right. opinion, just don't even use him at all. They, they don't need to keep using what the Joker. What if they're just hinting it? Because, like, you know how movies sometimes they do, like, that cliffhanger where mm-hmm. they hint it? Maybe mm-hmm. they're trying to do something like that, where they're just trying to hint that they're going to have it in the next movie. That, Get ready, fans. That was my impression, because mm-hmm. there, there did seem to be a deliberate gesture toward the Joker at the very end of the trailer. Yeah. When oh, the laugh. The you know, laugh at the end, but, yeah. But there, there was also like a curtain that kind of like lifted, yeah. and it was somebody behind bars. I think, Paul, and like, I think that's supposed to be Paul Dano's I, character. I don't I know, it's though. Supposed to be the Riddler. Is the, it? In the last trailer, mm-hmm. the trailer starts with his character being arrested by the police. True. So true. my, at least... Well, from what I can gather or what little mm. we know about the actual final product would be that that's him in prison. Yeah. Mm. So, so far we've seen uh, him getting arrested. The the shots that they showed in that, what we talked about today, those um, pictures of Bruce Wayne were all supposed to be, from what I read, uh, in the Riddler's apartment or in that character's apartment. So the best... To, Bias would be what I can imagine is that they're seeing him, they're having Bruce Wayne see him, or was it Batman in that trailer, or was it Bruce Wayne behind the glass on the other side? I don't even remember now. 
I, I don't remember. I believe either. it was Bruce Wayne, yeah. or I believe it was Batman. So, uh, <laughs> like, I don't know if he was in costume or not at, mm. at that point. So, mm. uh, it, it's really interesting. I see. Look, look, there's enough there with that character. You don't need to do the Joker right now. You just don't. Yeah, for sure. Especially like, if they did do the Joker, who's the actor that's going to play them? Or like rumored? Well, that's who we were just talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, Barry Cogan is the mm-hmm. name of the actor. They should just mm-hmm. bring back Joaquin Phoenix to yeah, play the Joker. That is I what want, I was hoping for. I wanted you know? Joaquin Phoenix to be in this movie because then that would be like a weird dynamic to have, like mm-hmm. um, Robert Patterson and Joaquin Phoenix. Together. I really wanted to see that after mm-hmm. the Joker. Yeah. Um, the from what I can understand of like I like I love Matt Reeves I love mm-hmm. the the Planet of the Apes trilogy, mm-hmm. his the this Batman movie seems more in line with that version of the with the Joaquin Phoenix version yes. of the Joker from uh, Todd uh, Phillips. Todd, thank you. Yeah. Oh my God, you're hired. <laughs> you're hired. Just uh, replace Miracle now. The funniest yeah. thing is like I'm like uh, Miracle hates the fact that outside like when we're not recording I'm basically a, a, a useless fax machine that just constantly is is giving useless movie information. Mm-hmm. But then like whenever I'm trying to remember it and recall on the site, it's a skill set. I, I have not quite mastered how to remember it mm-hmm. on call when like I really need to. It's only mm-hmm. I only remember it when I don't need to to actually remember it. Exactly. But, yeah. mm-hmm. but the the Todd Phillips version of the Joker and Matt Reeves version of the Batman so far from what we can see seem like those two worlds would meld pretty well. That's uh, why exactly. And that's why the the Batman it's called the Batman, right? Yes, yeah. the Batman. That's why this is the only like uh, superhero movie that I'm really interested in yep. seeing because it does seem to exist in that same world and for and we talked about this before off off air. Mm-hmm. Um the Joker is the first movie that really got comic books in, in in my view. Like I grew up with comic books. I grew up in the era where, you know, uh, Batman's back is broken by Bane yeah. and you know Superman is is killed and he comes back in all these different forms. Like I th- those comic books were like irresponsibly violent mm-hmm. and funny and perverse and twisted and exciting and it was I can't describe how exciting it is to read that stuff when you're seven or eight or nine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the Joker, the Joker movie really got it. Yep. Like it, it captured all of that thrill that you get reading these these crazy comic books when you're like that age. I just, I loved, I loved the Joker so much that I printed out the script <gasps> and really? I read it. That screenplay is brilliant. Every single nuance that is on screen in that movie is on the page yeah. and it's and it's described perfectly it's, it's really a, it's a masterpiece the what, joker's a masterpiece what's interesting is from what i understand that movie wasn't expected or wasn't designed to be a superhero movie or right. wasn't, it was just designed as a, a movie per se and then they adapted aspects of uh dc comics into it uh you know they uh, todd phillips said he's like let's just make a good movie and then call it joker right um, yeah. So that's interesting. I Normally, that. 99 times out of 100, that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. 99 times right. out of 100, you look at a lot of uh, uh, movies that come out that are, uh, like, you can tell that uh, a different idea was behind it. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, but we have to fit in these themes or within this realm. And then they shoehorn it in somewhere, some way, and it doesn't work. Right. Well, I, I just pulled up the script in front of me because the, the screenplay is interesting because it starts with a footnote. Well, not a footnote. It starts with an introduction, which screenplays don't. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you have the title page and then you're into it. Mm-hmm. But this says at the very beginning of The Joker, it says this story takes place in its own universe. <laughs> like That's so awesome. You know, mm-hmm. it, it says uh, we see it as a classic Warner Brothers movie, gritty, intimate and oddly funny. The characters live in a real world and the stakes are personal. Yeah. You know, like they they've they've already reframed it and just been like this is our movie we're not we're not aspiring to a superhero movie but like this this is about a person and a character and i just i love that and they followed through on it Mm -hmm. so beautifully and i hope the batman is like that too i really do it's uh i think probably best uh suited that way without being part of a multiverse like that's the only the only way that the joker fits in there within the Matt Reeves version is if they use the multiverse to explain it right. Otherwise timeline doesn't add up uh, the, you know, depending on when uh, I, th- I believe does uh, the Joker take place in the nineties, 1981, 80. Okay. So the early eighties, uh, it doesn't work timeline wise unless we adjust. So you use the multiverse, but for the most part, I don't find most like they, they use those as excuses for timeline errors, but mm-hmm. this one, it actually works because the tone is so similar yeah. that you don't have to worry as much because you get more engrossed in the story. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So for sure. Yep. Miracle thoughts. 
Well, I just really want Joaquin Phoenix back as the Joker because I like his portrayal um, portrayal of him because, like, you can actually see how this man became the Joker, like, slowly. Even though, like, in the comic books, the reason why Joker became Joker, if you read the original, it's because um, he was a different supervillain that fell into a vat of acid that made him slowly insane. It's boiling mm-hmm. acid. No. Yeah. Has, any, has anybody seen, that's from Batman Forever, no? Nobody yeah. Remember oh, yeah, that. I remember it's that. It's boiling acid. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I hope that guy gets like royalties every time that, <laughs> that, that is played. Yeah. yeah. No, um, something you just said uh, triggered a thought. Um, about the oh, mental well, psychology of him? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, but I guess my thought, if I have one, is mm-hmm. Joaquin Phoenix's performance in that movie is impossible. Yeah. It's an impossible performance. Mm-hmm. I don't know how he did that. I, I'll never know. And that's what mm-hmm. makes it such such a work of high art in terms yeah. of performance. It's just like, I don't know how he accomplished it. Like, I mm-hmm. could watch it over and over and find layers of nuance. Didn't he, like... Instead, like, I know actors, they do method acting or, like, they do research. Like He's not a method actor, I don't believe. I no. Believe he's, uh, he's, he takes the roles very seriously and then he mm-hmm. leaves the character at the at the door when he's done. Yeah, yeah, um, that's true. I, I could be wrong about I, I I remember reading an article around the time that movie came out. Some actors, they want to, you know, they want to embody that character while they're behind, well, you know, while they're off screen. Well, uh, uh, but I, I don't think he's that. I think he's one of those people, he's just that talented. He can act, you know, completely nuts and then leave it at the door and go back about his regular life i could be getting right. that uh, i don't know if uh, anybody can look that up so well, somebody might fact check me on that but uh yeah. I, I do remember reading something like that it might have been about a different actor uh i think that his collaboration if i remember some of the behind the scenes stories that i read with uh todd phillips was very open and he wasn't there's no way that he could have been the joker when they were like working out certain scenes mm-hmm. like that remember that goofy scene where he's um in the bathroom and he's kind of like yeah. doing this weird ballet dance like they yeah. just kind of kind of improvised that that day yeah. because whatever was on the page wasn't working for whatever reason but uh, a couple thoughts on that so um it, it, sometimes people t- tend to break down actors into method and non-method, yeah. you know, and uh, the Meisner technique. Yeah, and the Meisner. Yeah, that's that's pretty much the two different schools yeah. of thought in terms yeah. of performance. You know, uh, method actors are like Daniel Day Lewis, and Meisner technique is like Tom Cruise. Yeah. Tom mm-hmm. Cruise was Meisner trained in Meisner. Yeah. So that's why when I think he was with um, uh, James Lipton, and James Lipton was tr- kept trying to talk about like method stuff, and Tom mm-hmm. Cruise just like I don't get it. I'm just Meisner. Yeah. Um, but the best. Uh, example that I've ever heard of of that justifies method acting was uh, how F- Philip Seymour H- Hoffman talked about Capote. Do you remember this movie? He played yes. Truman Capote. Yep. Very, very, yep. Uh, very effect, uh, affected performance. Yeah. Affectatious. Um, and it made so much sense, his explanation. He was just like, once I have the hair and the outfit and the nasally tone and I'm him, it's just easier to kind of stay that way. Like an yeah. athlete, you know, once you're all warmed up, you just kind of have to stay warmed up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, well, that sounds more sane than other explanations I've heard for method acting. Acting. Yeah, you know, you're just you kind of have to maintain that same yep. thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but a more interesting distinction for me in terms of really good film performances is actors that have pathos and actors that don't have pathos. Mm-hmm. Okay, F- Joaquin Phoenix has pathos. Yes, DiCaprio does not. Mm-hmm. Explain. You know, okay, so it's really hard to explain. It's it's a strange dynamic, but I I, I just kind of come from that world of theater acting. I thought a lot, very deeply about acting, mm-hmm. and pathos means that it's it's a it's a Greek term that basically just means um, it comes it, like. It's a, it's a thing that's in your performance that's so innate and instinctive that you don't have to think about it, mm-hmm. you know? And Joaquin, Joaquin Phoenix is one of those actors that's just, just dialed into it. Yeah. Meryl Streep, it, she's dialed into it, you know? Yeah. But you see a DiCaprio performance. You see a Day-Lewis a day Lewis performance, and sometimes they seem overbaked, overcooked, mm-hmm. like they've thought about it. And I mean, mm-hmm. and they don't, it's not, I'm not saying they give mm-hmm. bad performances. So I think they give good performances. So in a way. So yes. is this the reason why sure. DiCaprio um, didn't win a uh, Grammy until later? He, he didn't he win any Grammy. No, no, <laughs> no not Grammy. Grammy did he win? This is my second time saying Grammy. Golden Globe. My bad. Uh, this you, is mean, my... you mean Oscar, actually. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. This is my second time messing up the awards because so I don't care about them anymore. Fair enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, there, that's there's a. There's an actor named Ron Rifkin. Uh, yeah. He does, uh, he was, I remember him from the show Alias. I love the show mm-hmm. Alias. I love 90 spy and 2000 spy dramas. And he talks about how his performances are intentionally understated. Mm-hmm. Meaning that you'll find subtle distinctions between, he, he in in um, Alias, he plays an older version, you know, an older CIA agent, uh, or he's like running a CIA uh, offshoot, right? Mm-hmm. But then in the show, in the Limitless TV show, he plays uh, this screw up, this kid screw up's dad. And 
he's like, but my physical form is still the same. I'm still somewhat, fr- I'm older, I'm frail. I can't undo that. You know, there might have been like aspects of me when I was younger in a spy drama where I was more physically fit, but that's not playing into this role right now. So not as much has changed. The delivery is still the same unless otherwise instructed. He's still performing at w- within a certain cadence. Mm-hmm. He still moves in a slower manner. So he says he particularly he specifically goes for understated performances because it uh, allows him to find the character more naturally. Mm. And it works in film. You yeah. can't do that kind of thing in theater so much mm-hmm. because film. I've, you have to be big in theater. You have to. Mm-hmm. But the, it's a weird thing. The camera. Certain actors have talked about this. I can't remember if it was Viggo Mortensen that mentioned it, but they say you're not going to believe this, but the camera can read your mind. You know, oh, yeah. like it just reads. And that's why that understated, you know, approach really is effective for certain actors. Yep. Yep. The camera re- can read your thoughts. Not to mention how, di- I don't know how many people have actually like filmed like on a set and like how hard it is to not treat that camera as an object in front of you. Mm-hmm. Like to that you have to just pretend it's not there, but also you have to knowingly not address it mm-hmm. at the same time. Uh, there's a really, I've, there was an old reel on YouTube of like actors, for, like somebody compiled various like, um, like from blooper reels of like where they accidentally like catch the camera, but with their eye yeah. and, and they like, go, I love they, that. and they get really frustrated because yeah. they're like when the director chooses like this big sweeping shot that comes across and like, they're just, yeah. you know, they have to be make nine steps and they have to reach their mark at just the right point. Right. But then at the same time, they have to be aware of a camera that's coming in from behind them and moving through the, through the, you know, the visual space. Like it's yeah. a much more nuanced career. Like as much as I like to rag on actors, uh, it's a much more nuanced and difficult profession than a lot mm-hmm. of people give it credit for. It requires a lot of very weird technique yeah. and experience mm-hmm. with that. A weird little tangential story that I love so much about the, off of what you just said. Sergio Leone's uh, 1984 movie, Once Upon a Time in America. It's an it's a epic movie about uh, uh, Jewish gangsters yeah. set in, in New York. Um, and Sergio Leone, he worked with a purely Italian crew who, you know, are very reverent about performances and making yep. sure they don't interrupt the actors. Mm-hmm. So Leone, uh, he set up this nine minute like sweeping shot that goes over and over and over. And it's supposed to end with James Woods. The camera gets right to his face and James Woods like sheds a single tear. Yeah. Ooh. So the cameraman thinks to himself, wow, I don't want my facial expressions to uh, interrupt James Woods's tear. So he put a pillowcase over his head and <laughs> cut out eye holes. There had to be a better <laughs> then, way to do that, right? And, and then, so uh, James Woods is in the moment. All of a sudden, he looks up and he sees Birth of a Nation. He starts freaking out. <laughs> 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 the cameraman's just like, I didn't want to distract you, James. And James is just like, what are you doing? How you just he distracted not, me. <laughs> how does he not give him that notice beforehand? <laughs> uh, I guess he didn't want to distract him. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus Christ. How does he not know that a vastly different uh, image mm. on the... Produ- on the on, it was on the it was on the cameraman. guy the cameraman yeah like, how does he not know that the guy operator. that's literally going to be right in front of him is going to look completely different how does he not know that that won't be distracting different culture different culture man. different time <laughs> yeah. totally different time thanks for watching this clip guys if you want to see full episodes or follow us on social media links are in the description below bye, bye.